Hey, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to the Writer's Bookshelf. So today we're going to do another interesting book that's craft related but not entirely craft focused. It's one that I think is, um, it's an important one to read for perspective. It doesn't necessarily give you some brand new skills. Uh, I think if we were to look at it as a skills book, it's, you know, it's more of a philosophy book than anything. And what it is, it's um, it's actually it's based on a uh, college professor or English professor's lectures, and it's called "From Where You Dream" is the name of the book. It's by uh, Robert Olin Butler is the the speaker. The, um, so his name is on the book, but he didn't actually write the book. The the book is transcribed. Uh, Janet Burroway is the is the one who actually edited uh, the book. She she's taking his lectures and she's turning it into uh, a print book for you. And it's a very kind of simple, straightforward book. Uh, each chapter is is one day in the, in the lecture series, and of course, each lecture is about a particular topic of interest. And what the whole book's job is to get you to kind of rethink how you approach your stories. So, when we talk about structure and we talk about um, plotting and all of that, um, we're using structure, we're using plotting, we're using even pantsing, we're using all of this as a form of approach to writing. Um, we also have the snowflake method, it's like a hybrid approach. Um, the From Where You Dream actually covers a more, um, it's almost like a more, meta, uh, what am I trying to say here, um, transcendental approach. I'm not even sure how to word it, but it, it's a different kind of approach altogether where you're, you're approaching your fiction from from your dream space, not your head space. And I know that sounds really wacky, and it kind of is, to be honest. It's it's a very uh, very college way of approaching writing, uh, but not like in an academic um, like. It's more of a philosophical way of approaching writing, and less of a of a um, of a structured way. And this is where I think it's an interesting. Uh, book to kind of broaden your horizon on how to approach storytelling and his point of view um, is that he he's like a, he's been writing um, I think since maybe the 80s um, pro uh, well probably earlier than that but um, pub published since the 80s but um, he looks back at his work and he just kind of hates his work he, he thinks that everything he's he has written prior to this lecture is dribble and the, the purpose of the lecture is to get him and his students to go back and rethink what good storytelling is and it's it's about coming at your at the story from from your inner core from the stuff that wakes you up in the middle of the night from the stuff that has to be told and he, he goes into uh the chat first chapter is called the boot camp and i'll just show you it's um it's actually the first chapter is the introduction from Janet Burroway. But you have the first part of the, are the lectures here. And it's um, Boot Camp's the first one. It gives you a quote from uh, Akira Kurosawa, who I believe is the one who wrote Seven Samurai. Um, but he uh, he opens with this, this statement. I need to make this clear first off. No matter where you are in your writing career, if you aspire to create literature, if you aspire to be an artist in the medium of language, if you aspire to create narratives of whatever length that uh, arrive at the condition of art, there are fundamental truths that the artistic process to which you must attend. Um, and then he talks about how he, um, in the two decades he's been teaching the subject, he's read many uh, manuscripts that, um, okay, he says virtually all of them, virtually all of them fail to show an intuitive command of the essentials of the process of fictional art because of the creative writing and pedagog, pedag I can't even say the word, pedagogy uh, if you know how to pronounce it let me know uh, in this country and because of the nature of this art form and because of the medium you work with and because of the rigors of artistic vision and because of you then because no one has ever told you these things clearly the great likelihood is that all of the fiction you've written is mortally flawed in terms of the essentials of the process and what he's trying to do is he's trying to get you to think about the process in a way that um, approaches it as an artist not as a not it from a head space but from a heart space um and he talks it's kind of like in a um using the same principles that our book from last week the uh, motion craft of fiction covers it's 
it's approaching the uh, art of fiction from the stuff that that gives fiction its meaning um, and it's not just ideas but um, but like beliefs and, and, and um, the human conditioning talks about um, I'm not going to be uh, it's sorry it's not going to be an easy message to hear but I'm going to tell you right up front before I wrote my first published novel I wrote literally a million words of absolute dreck five awful novels 40 dreadful short stories and a dozen truly terrible full plays made all those fatal errors a process I would bet my mortgage you're making now I want to help you get around that but you've got to open up and listen to me about this if you are not prepared to do that if you're not prepared to open your sensibilities and incidentally your minds to what I'm going to tell you and to the implications for the work you have done and will do then it's best that you and I part ways now there are some folks in this room who will attest that to the fact that it's going to be tough it's going to be nerve-wracking it's going to be un going to unsettle you but I think they will also attest to the rewards are worth it so you must to be in here have the highest aspirations for yourselves as writers to uh, desire to create works of fiction that will endure that reflect the articulate and deepest truths about the human condition if that is your aspiration and this is where you belong I will not blow you off I will take your aspirations seriously and I will demand that you take them seriously um, I always begin with something the great Japanese film director Akira Kurosawa, Kurosawa once said he said to be an artist means never to avert your eyes to be an artist means never to avert your eyes that is the absolute essential truth here you're going to be and probably always have been led to avert your eyes but turning from that path is what it means to be an artist you need courage and that's something I can't teach you I can teach you that you've got to have it what does an artist do so you can kind of get a feel for what he's actually doing here he's he's approaching this from from a professor point of view certainly as a mentor point of view um, but he's he's approaching it not as like a formula or anything like that but as a uh, as a, a source of being like this is where you begin your artist journey by acknowledging that you're an artist essentially what he's saying here and um, that means he's going through like the senses and he's going through um, things where um, um, basically he just he, he's trying to get you to tap into what drives you uh, what makes you want to write essentially and uh, that's just the first chapter um, remember every chapter is actually it's a lecture date uh, but he goes on further and deeper into this concept of drawing out that um, that need to write out of you and and certain muscles that it takes to to write well and so he when he gets into the second chapter called the zone what he's actually doing is he's echoing um, sports stars like Michael Jordan and um, how he he's a basketball player um, who doesn't even need to think about his craft anymore he just does and that's sort of what uh, Robert Olin Butler is trying to communicate in his lecture is when you're an artist or a writer you're not thinking you're just being you're, you're writing from your from your muscle memory from your from your need to um, be in the zone which we all I think hopefully by now we know what that means um, and he's, he's giving you tips on how to find what your zone is and then how to um, let that zone you know pour out from you so that when you're writing um, you're not letting your head get in the way and he always goes back to the same point this is why the, the title of the book is from where you dream he's telling you it's not where you think it's it's not where you get in the way of your characters or the story the situation because you're trying to achieve an agenda what you're actually doing is you're allowing the dream to take over here and, and not to be like uh, um, you, nothing psychedelic here you're, you're not it's not nothing uh, Hunter S Thompson here it's 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 literally about recognizing that our dream space is where are the most things that are important to us matter because I know I, I have that too like my dreams get wacky sure uh, I actually just had a dream as a I'm recording this on um, May 24th um, so it, it, you know, the video will be out probably September or October so it's a long distance up between when I'm recording this and when you'll see it but uh, what I can tell you is my dream that I had last night before waking up was I, I was um, I some in some field that I, I remember I was I think at the old wet and wild but it was like my um, memory of wet and wild which my I always have this memory of wet and wild not a real uh, 
it's not a, not an actual memory, but like the dream, of Wet and Wild being this kind of this platform, like a train, like a monorail uh, train station with like these water tubes on either side, and then you have um, like this kind of boardwalk space beneath it, and then um, you've got like your um, you know your place where you you mount all your your clothing, like your shoes and things over like on down the ground level, but you have to climb up to this train station to get to your water slides and then you have and by the way this is not how wet and wild was actually structured this is just the way it often reflects in my dreams and then you have um this kind of a boardwalk where you go to like this big area where you can eat your food and then you, there's like a ferris wheel uh that's lit up at night like you know bombastically you know and and so like in this dream i'm back there again um it's been a while since i've been there in my dream but once again, it, it, this dream has been reflected, but the dream starts off where I'm actually in a field and there's a van. One of my friends is, is there and I'm trying to just talk to my friend. And it's funny because um, I'm having that conversation with this friend about another friend who I don't realize is in the van uh, right around the corner. And so I end up bringing both friends into this conversation, but then somehow they get um, kind of shoved off into this behind this fence. And behind the fence is an ocean, and even though the, the ocean is kind of like more, it's like a pond in and, and, and practice, but it's the ocean and there's this giant shark out in the ocean, but I can't see the shark because of the fence, but I know it's there. The fence is like, um, um, it's kind of sealed off. It, it's actually got the color of my water bottle here. Um, but there's a guardian, um, this older lady who doesn't want anyone getting in, inside, the, you know, getting onto the beach beyond the fence. And I don't even know where my friends are, are uh, in play on this anymore, but the idea, it, it kind of reverts back into one of, one of my usual kind of uh, chase stories, but it's a chase story kind of in reverse where I'm trying to hide. Um, and it gets into like this amalgam of, of genres in my own dream, but it's also taking a lot of my old memories of, of a version of What and Wild that doesn't actually exist. Um, but it's like the way I've always reinterpreted Wet and Wild, uh, which again, if you're not familiar with what I'm even talking about, it's an old water park um, in uh, Orlando. It's like right, it's in the same area as Universal Studios, and it actually was owned by Universal Studios for years. And they um, in 2017 they they shut it down and they replaced it with a new water park called Volcano Beach, I believe it's called, or something Volcano. Um, but um, but the old wet and wild had like you know your classic drop slides and you had like your two slides and um, you know I mean it, it was it was getting kind of grungy you know of all the years it's been around um, it was probably in need of being replaced but I just had a lot of fond memories that you know when I used to go and and so sometimes in my dreams I will go back there or or I'll have the invitation to go back and. You know, it might be um, a reflection too of, of that one time when I was eight years old. We had another water park in, um, down in Dania called um, Six Flags Atlantis. And when I was eight years old, my dad promised to take me and my friends to Six Flags Atlantis. And, um, but we had to first go to the comic book convention in Miami first, and he ended up spending all his money at the comic book convention. And so we didn't end up going to the water park, and that was a really you know, major letdown major disappointment and, and I know a lot of times in my dreams my dreams will be reflective of these disappointments from childhood and I think a lot of times when I have this dream of wet and wild which is again a completely different water park it's just if you're if you lost track of where I am um, I think a lot of my dreams are still reflective of all the times I've been promised something that I wasn't given uh, or I was led to believe uh, that I would do something that I ultimately didn't get to do and I'm sure we all have those experiences but this you know this recurring dream is a reflection of that and so the point I'm, I'm bringing all this up to say that in my heart you know my mind all that like this dream would be kind of an indicator that I have a lack I have something that a, a yearning even there's a chapter three is on yearning uh, which if we if you go way back in time um, and when I say way back in time for you guys it's actually but very recent for me, there's yearning. Um, if you go back to episode six of this season, uh, or episode 26 of the entire series, from the Compass of Character, we talked about yearning. And, and I say way back from your perspective, from when this airs, but it actually just released on YouTube for, for me uh, Friday. Um, 
even though I recorded it weeks ago. But anyway, I'm, you know, that's the behind the scenes stuff. But, you know, yearning is that thing that your, um, that your characters absolutely have to have um, to make the story worth telling. And if they don't have that yearn, if, they, if, if, if what they want is insignificant, uh, then the story will be insignificant. And this is where um, Robert Owen Butler talks about this idea he had from Vietnam and how this um, character needed to, um, his whole, the whole story is based on an event that Robert Owen Butler himself faced when he, I guess, uh, was in Vietnam or come out, came out of Vietnam or whatever it was. It, it took place in Vietnam, but he saw this graffiti on the wall and he decided to tell the story of the character imprisoned in that room who needed to find out who wrote the graffiti on the wall. And what he really realized was that um, the story had no teeth. It didn't go anywhere because there was no yearning. Like the, the story basic idea didn't really have a reason to be told. It was just an idea. And, um, and so that's another point he's getting at is like when you start from your dreams, you, you, you look for the thing that actually matters. Um, and so for me, I might want to know, like, you know, how, you know, what's this character, um, how does he overcome uh, this huge disappointment in his life where maybe he was given a promise that, you know, whoever was entrusted to fulfill that promise did not fulfill the promise. How does he, you know, cope from that or how does he maybe turn it around and, you know, 30 years later maybe he's in the position to make a promise, does he keep it or, I don't know, I mean, there's things that you can kind of do to track your way through but you might even go with something literal and maybe the story is about you know the promise of a f you know fulfilling a journey to a water park and you know can you make it there and, and what's the emotional significance behind that and I mean take a movie like Vacation the original um, Chevy Chase you know National Lampoon's Vacation when the whole story is them trying to get to Wally World and of course you know the comedy is all the you know stuff that happens along the way but but the tragic, you know, uh, outcome is, you know, spoiler alert if you haven't seen this 40-year-old movie, is that uh, they get to Wally World and it's closed for renovations. You know, and then it's like, this is before the internet, so, like, they couldn't just look up to see if it was open. Uh, they took a chance, you know, they drove from Chicago all the way down to, uh, you know, Los Angeles to wherever Wally World is, and it was closed. And it was a big letdown, but it was a letdown not, wasn't Clark Griswold's fault, it was the fault of, you know, the park owners. And of course, you know, if you saw the, the movie, you find that they got in anyway. How they did it, you know, you'll have to see the movie if you never have. But um, but there's also a message in the story too where it is it is about the journey. It's not about the destination. And so there's a bit of a theme in there too. Not that this book is about theme, but <clears throat> if I were to use my dream as a, as a way to explore the storyline, that might be a place to start. But maybe, you know, in the journey, you know, I'm, there might be other things that come out. I don't know. And, this, and that's part of the point is sometimes it's about exploring where things go. But it starts with the dream. It starts with the yearning, with the desire and all that. And, and so that's something else that he goes through. And then he eventually goes into um, chapter four is the cinema of the mind. And this is where he actually, this is the one that I think was most memorable from when I read it 15 years ago. Um, and this is where he actually talks about um, like Charles Dickens and you know these writers here around long before movies, but he uses movies or the cinema as a way to show a scene unfolding. And what he's doing is he's trying to get you to visualize what things look like and how to deliver it in a, in a way that evokes the the reader's imagination. And so it's not just about you know describing you know a room you know with a gray and, and black curtain behind it that wave with the you know the fan um as it gave a little bit of that undulation and like okay it, it's not really about that but it it could be if my story is somehow reflective of let's say a shroud maybe i wanted to um you know hide the fact that i have you know another box of book behind books behind me um i've got you know a bed behind me um you know clothing rack behind me um, it's like a, it's, it's a bedroom that's not really a bedroom. It's like a, it's a bedroom that's like a lived in space, you know, it's, 
and so the the curtain is there to just kind of separate the the living space from the workspace you know call it that but you know if i were to explain it in a way that's mysterious i might want to focus on the shroud itself which would be the curtain and so that's sort of the point he's making with cinema of the mind is you focus on the element that that sparks the imagination so you know i might describe something like you know as he sits at his desk speaking into his microphone and webcam hiding you know the um you know the elements that protect his privacy from his workspace um the black curtain shakes you know will it fall will it help will it rise I don't know, i'm just making stuff up now but um he might focus on the curtain as that that thing that splits the two um personas even or the or the two um spaces um between um maybe practical and safety or i don't know uh, whatever your reasons might be um the cinema of the mind's job is to display the um dis display the scene or the image in a way that that makes the dream important if, if that all makes sense um but anyway but he he talks about how writers like dickens will use the visual you will use the the camera to paint a picture that's that's emotionally resonant um, and evokes feeling and all that stuff um and then he has the right of repairs and this is where um i think is probably the most interesting chapter from the first part this is where it's um when you think of structure and you think of um the writing craft you know we we often talk about the, the difference between the plotters and the pantsters and then there's like a um, kind of a middle ground where you introduce the snowflake method. So you know, the snowflake method uses a little bit of each in order to come through. Uh, what Butler is actually suggesting goes beyond all of that, and he's using the dream space as your story uh, canvas or your, your planning uh, canvas. And then um, this is actually the uh, way I would often write. Um, it's the way I'm doing my um, my Ken novella story. Um, the hybrid city and uh, entrepreneur. It's the way I did um, my 2019 NaNoWriMo um, book called uh, Washed Up Pirate Adventure, which I um, still haven't finished yet. But even um, the one I did for 2020, um, the one that I wanted to do since 2010 called Nice and Legal, uh, these all started from the dream space. I, I didn't really outline them. I mean, I outlined them as I went. So there is an outline that exists, but it wasn't one that I came up with first. Is one that I created as I went because I, I started from where my um, from the ideas that I had just kind of building over the years, and that's something he suggests in chapter five is is tell your story from the dream first, uh, allow it to kind of percolate in your mind, allow allow the images to come through, allow um, allow it to have a, a place to kind of build in your mind before you put it on paper, so that you can see the entire story before you write the first word. And I think I personally find that's the, one of the most effective ways to write. Um, it's the only way I've been able to write um, story like the one I'm doing now. I'm already uh, what, seven episodes and thirty thousand words into it because I already know what the story is, and I, and I, you know, the only outline I have is just a really general you know, synopsis of, of of what I want to happen when. But it's but I've, I already know what the, the images look like because I've, I've played them out in my head. It's also based on a game that I created, you know, or started working on ten years ago. So it's like even with that, I can just translate the images of the game into the into the story. So I have all these little pieces in play that's already given me a perspective of what I want the story to be. So all I'm doing is just transcribing what I remember about it. Um, it makes it really easy to tell the story competently, to stay focused on it, and to get it done quickly. Um, I mean, th I've, again, thirty thousand words already, and I started in um, late April is I think is when I published the first uh, episode and even though Ken Novella as of this recording isn't live yet so and I actually um, went back and reviewed some of those episodes and republished them so um, so there's actually you know, they won't reflect the original publishing dates but uh, but point being is that I have now over 30,000 words of story content that I didn't really have to pre-plan because I've just I've already figured it out as I um, as I wrote it down, and that's what he's kind of getting at there. 
Um, and then so when he gets to the next part of the workshop, uh, I'm just going to kind of briefly summarize these. But um, he talks about reading lit crit in the workshop. And this is where he basically goes on a diatribe about literary critics who read too fast. It's actually pretty funny. Um, he's making the point that uh, if you're going to read fiction, you should not speed read. Because if your words matter, then speed reading is going to lose the context of those words. And that's where a lot of literary critics don't actually understand what in the heck they're reading because they read it too fast. Um, you shouldn't, if you want to really understand it, like you shouldn't skim. And if you do skim, you should miss stuff because you, um, because every word uh, doesn't just tell a story, it also evokes an emotion and it evokes um, a connection and all of that, all the stuff that we also learned in the last book. And um, if you're a reader, uh, you are doing your book a disservice by speed reading. It's kind of his point. Um, because you, you aren't going to catch everything, including the stuff that matters. Um, so it's just it's funny that he goes into that. But he's basically making the point that when you're, you're writing, don't read for the speed, or don't write for the speed reader. You know, write for the, for the person that actually cares about your art, for the literature. Um, it doesn't mean that he doesn't think that you shouldn't have something to say because he definitely thinks you should have something to say because it's all interwoven. It's just that, you know, have, have something to say in a way that all the words make a difference so that anyone who speeds through it will miss something. Um, and then, so then, anyway, that's chapter six, um, the short version of it. And then there's chapter seven is called... <laughs> The bad story and this is where he uh, talks a little bit about his own work and how he, he does an excerpt of a story called open arms and he just he kind of explains why it's a piece of crap um, and uh, what he could have done differently to make it better and uh, then he also has a commentary on a few other works too that were equally bad um, what I like about it is it goes and talks about why it's bad. It doesn't just say it's bad and it's on. I mean, he talks about what he could have done differently to make it better um, if he had wanted to. Um, then you have from in, from episode eight on, or episode eight, I'm in the Kindle Bella mindset. Uh, from chapter eight on, um, he's getting into the actual practical uh, work. Because don't forget, this is based on a college course. Um, a series of lectures in that course from FSU and um, so he is still talking to students and students who have to submit materials so from this point on we're getting into like the materials and his crit critique of it so I'm not going to really get to in depth on what that is but, um, but ultimately what you can see here from uh, this book from where you dream is it's a new approach to storytelling and a new approach to um, making your fiction matter um, and it, again, it's an older book. It came out in mid 2000s. Um, it's not a craft book in the traditional sense. It's not going to you know cover all the basics from develop, character development on through publication. In fact, it doesn't really deal with any of that. It, it, what it does is it, it just goes through um, the many ways in which a story can fail, and it's just trying to convince you to you know come start from your dream space so that um, you recognize what truly matters in the work and so that you can draw the details and the, and the um, elements that your reader's going to um, you know, empathize with or that's going to show or reflect um, your attitude of the story and why it matters to you and ultimately why it should matter to your reader and all that. And, and I think it's an important lesson to consider because... Um, Again, we're writing to connect to our readers. We're not necessarily writing to stroke our egos. And if we are writing to stroke our egos, then you know, go write a blog um, or write, you know, write a journal. You know, um, not that you need a journal to stroke an ego, but you know, sometimes it is about creating and for the sake of creating. Um, but his point is, you know, don't waste your words. You know, don't um, don't waste your time on stuff that doesn't need to be told. Uh, make sure that what you have to uh, say matters and it usually begins from the dream. The dream is a reflection of the stuff that matters to us. 
Um, and if he ever woke up in the middle of the night uh, sweating, as he says, um, you know, it's, I mean, take into consideration why. Um, why are you waking up sweating? And um, I think this is the book where he talks about passion. Is this the, is either this one or the last one I just did? Um, I think it's this one. I think I'm not getting the story wrong. Um, oh, you know what I think of as the Martial Craft of Fiction? Or I'm thinking of passion. You know what, never mind. You're going to read both books. So I was going to say uh, one of them talks about the difference between passion and romance versus, uh, you know, where you're, you're sweating and pal heart's palpitating versus heart palpitating because you walked up a giant flight of stairs. I thought it was this one. Um, Anyhow, oh yes, it is this one. Um, right. There's a really cool anecdote I, I saw in here about. Um, I just I, I'm wondering if I got the wrong book for this one. Doesn't matter. Um. Yeah, but either way, it's just the whole point of it is it challenges you to think your way through. I'm oh, sorry, to not think your way through. Um, to feel your way through your story so that um, what matters to you can have a chance to matter to your reader. And ultimately, that's what gets the reader coming back for your next book. Um, that's why I have a lot of the books that I read. I, I, I They just, the authors, they struck me the, the right way. Even um, kind of my, my new favorite is Stuart Turton, who wrote uh, The Seven Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. Um, he has a way of subverting expectations, kind of almost in the tradition of uh, Ryan, uh, the guy who did Knives Out. I, forget, uh, what's his, I don't remember his last name at the moment. He did, he did the really bad Star Wars movies, but he did the excellent Knives Out. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, Stuart Turden has, um, he, he kind of writes in the vein of uh, Ryan, I, I want to say Ryan Johnson's his name. Um, But he's got that that um, that way of approaching storytelling uh, in the in the unexpected, and, but it still hits you in the feels in a way because um, it's you're surprised by by um, just the way th things play out. Um, I don't know. I'm just I'm, I feel like I'm rambling now, but it, it's uh, it's important to get your reader to want to come back and. The thought process doesn't always allow you to do that because the thought process is going to train you to make decisions that might actually be contrary to um, what's realistic. And that was actually another point that he made in the book that I want to end on, is he talks about how one of the characters, I think in Open Arms, um, he ends up interrogating this, this other character in a way that's very insensitive to the situation. And he's thinking in real life, most people wouldn't do that. The only reason why it happened at all in the story is because plot-wise it had to be done. Otherwise, the next plot point you needed to get to wouldn't have been possible. And if you're allowing your plot or your thought process to get in the way of, real, of what would naturally happen, uh, organically or otherwise, then you're betraying your characters, you're betraying the story, you're betraying the reader. And that's where the planning can get in the way of the... Um, of the thing that's actually necessary for the story. So when he's talking about the dream space, he's actually telling you, you know, allow yourself to be a human being when you're telling the story and allow yourself to feel for the, for the characters and their situations, which is something I'm trying to do even now. Like I do try to put myself in the position, almost like an actor would um, when they're trying to embody a character. How would this character respond in this situation? Um, and what would be the natural response? And if, if they respond any differently, does that mean I got my character wrong? Does that mean I, I've misinterpreted what it means to be a human being? Um, and these are really complex questions that every writer is ultimately going to face. Because if we have to ask that question, what does it mean to be a human being, then we definitely 
have been divorced from our own selves, our own being, our own thought process, and our own dream space. And if we can get back to that place where it's natural, um, then we have a chance to succeed at this. So I think that's the point of this. But um, anyway, it's a good book. Like I said, it's been a while since I've read it. I didn't care for it the first time I read it, just to be honest. Uh, I thought it was pretentious as crap. Uh, as you know, I would always expect that from any university professor teaching English. Um, but again, that was my own, I think, cynical viewpoint from that era because I had just recently graduated college at the time that I read it. Um, but I think going back and reading it again, just you know, to refresh my memory of what's in there, um, I have a different opinion of it. I, I think it's actually really well uh, crafted and well thought through. But again, it's not a craft book. It's it's literally. It's an academic work, um, but it's one that really gets you thinking and, and thinking about not thinking, which is really a strange way of dealing with metacognition. But um, anyway, it's, I think it's worth it. Definitely check it out. Um, as far as the series go, we have, uh, goes, we have two more um, books left in the regular se season, and I'll have probably four bonuses, um, which will be a like first Friday of each month, and then uh, Season three will probably be sometime in March, uh, most likely, depending on uh, how expensive it's going to be to get the books I need for it. Um, but anyway, just kind of be aware that we are winding down. So I mean, thank you for sticking with it this long. Um, if you have um, any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. Don't forget to slice this. Sub <laughs> Cannot speak. Don't forget to like, subscribe, do all the things that YouTubers tell you to do. Hit the bell um, and um, share your experiences with your writing so far. Let me know which books so your, has been your favorite from the series and from the season. And um, if you have suggestions for future books you'd like me to cover down the road, do let me know. Um, as usual, my slate is pretty full for the next coming season, um, at least as far as my ideas go for it. Um, I'm probably going to be looking for books for season five i know i'm playing that far ahead but um season five if i go on that long it's probably gonna be where i want to start looking at some more uh, variety again it's kind of outside of theme uh, but if you have anything you really like that you want to recommend go ahead and leave it in the comments below you know so we'll check it out and um and if you're a writer of one of these books who wants to um hype up your next book or whatever again just let me know in the comments what you're working on or what you're released excuse me or what y'all what you think we shall read so anyway. that's it for today thanks for uh, watching and come back next week we'll be doing a, a really really good book um, on just kind of like the whole process of um, storytelling and um, hope you come back for that and uh, we'll see you then so until then thanks for watching and uh, have a good day take care bye